Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. So the other day I started working on this part and my mill wouldn't cut a right angle. Super weird. So it was a pretty involved process of debugging the machine to figure out where the error was coming from. I thought you might find it helpful, so let's go. This is the material that I was going to use to make this part. It's 3 inch aluminum extrusion and basically the part is a cube so I need to start by facing all the sides nice and flat and get everything squared up. So I thought I would use the fly cutter for that for the really nice finish and because it's a way to cut a 4 inch diameter on my small mill and do it in one pass. I started by doing a test cut on a piece of scrap that's the same material so that I could get my speeds and feeds dialed in and make sure I was going to get the finish that I wanted and check that the fly cutter was running well and it was so I thought I was ready to proceed. And away we go on the actual workpiece. This is 1200 RPM. I'm using WD-40 as a cutting fluid since this is aluminum that works very well and the feed is running about as slow as my power feed will go to give that fly cutter lots of time to come around on each lap. And I'm very happy with this finish, so confidence is high. Things are looking really good so far. And then of course the next step is to rotate it 90 degrees, put that machine face against the fixed jaw, and machine the next face. And if everything went well, then the end result should be nice and square. Uh-oh. Something really fishy is going on here. Why didn't it cut square? Well, one reason would be if the back side of it wasn't vertical when the cut was made. So I put it back in the vise the same way I had with a machined surface on the fixed jaw, and I put an indicator back there and measured it. And you can see that over three inches, it's 15 thou off of vertical. So that's pretty weird. So I had a hypothesis and I turned it 90 degrees. With the part rotated, the error mostly goes away. We got a couple thou there that I'll explain in a moment. But that's pretty interesting. Here's the setup that I'm using. I've got a parallel at one end, a piece of round bar on the movable jaw so that the fixed jaw is holding that machine surface and nothing else is influencing the squareness of the setup. But that 90 degree turn shouldn't have mattered. However, let's put a straight edge on this top surface and see what we've got. Do you see that? The edges of the straight edge are touching and the center is showing light. If I turn the part 90 degrees, no light showing through anywhere. So I was suspecting I had a tram issue because if the mill is out of tram with a large diameter cutter especially, then you're going to cut a, f a surface that isn't flat. You're going to get a curved surface that runs parallel to the center line of the cutter. So you're going to cut like a water slide effectively. And uh, there's nothing like a fly cutter to expose tram issues with your mill. So let's look at the effect of cutter size on surface flatness and that water slide effect. So as we saw, if you've got a large diameter cutter, you know, instead of cutting flat like it should, if your mill is way out of tram, then you're going to be cutting that water slide. Now, imagine this same issue, but with a tiny diameter cutter. So now you're making tiny water slides, but now instead of a single pass on the entire surface like we did with the fly cutter, imagine we're doing like a hundred tiny passes across the surface. You can see how you're going to end up with a bunch of tiny water slides but the squareness of the surface is not affected by the misalignment of that cutter to the surface. You're going to end up with a surface that isn't very flat. It's going to have a wave to it, but it is still going to be square. But if tram doesn't affect squareness of the cut, then why, why do I suspect tram? Here's my theory. Imagine that water slide up against the fixed jaw of the vise. You can see how it could cause the back surface there to lean backwards slightly. And that might be why when I turn the part 90 degrees, the problem went away. Now I still had a slight couple of thou lean there, but that could be because the part wasn't perfectly square and so I was still registering a small portion of that water slide just at an oblique angle. Here's another symptom of tram issues. When I was cutting back the other way, you can see that the cutter is double cutting. It's, there's a very slight cutting action on the back side. That should never happen. So if you're getting no double cutting one way and slight double cutting the other way, that tells you that A, there's a bit of a tram issue, and B, it tells you which direction the tram problem is. So in this view, the cutter that's on the left side of your screen is low, because when we cut backwards, that backside is touching. Now that doesn't affect the cutter on the front stroke, because then the trailing edge of the cutter is high, and so it's just getting extra clearance. So that tells you that the head of my mill is leaning slightly to the left at, in the perspective of this frame. Nothing to it but to remove the vise and check the tram. So we have one thou on that side and swing it around to the other side 
And we're showing, oh my goodness, six and a half thou. So we are five and a half thou out of tram. That is terrible. And our measurements confirmed what we saw in the cut, which is that the head is tilted to the left. Now I did a video in my mill skill series on tramming, so I'm not gonna cover it in detail again here, but basically you loosen the bolts on the head, tap back and forth until you get the same reading on the block at both ends using something like this homemade fixture here. And then you tighten it back in, being careful that it hasn't moved while you do that. And then it usually does move when you tighten it, so you do it again. And then again, and again, and again. Okay, so now we're reading zero there. And we'll go swing around to the other side. The other side reading is half a thou. That's fantastic. So that's half a thou over 24 inches. That is pretty darn good. So let's take another test cut here. And I got the surface blued here just so I can see the effects of a light cut. All right, let's see how we did. Now we have a one thou high spot in the middle. We turned our water slide into a molehill. That's weird. Let's do a different type of cut and see if we can learn something more. So without moving the part or changing anything about my setup or the settings in the machine, I put a two inch diameter cutter in there, half the size, and did two passes on that same surface, making sure I cut deep enough to get rid of any molehills or water slides. And uh, let's see what we get on this surface now. Now the surface is very flat, except we have a one thou step between those cuts. So within each cut, the surface is extremely flat as we would expect, but we've got a little step between the cuts. Now that could still be a tram issue because imagine two water slides next to each other, except they overlap by 50%. The two edges of those water slides are not gonna line up properly height wise. And so you're gonna get a step. But before we go any further, let's check a few basics to eliminate variables. So I'm indicating the base of the vise to make sure it's flat and level and everything. And uh, that all reads correct. There's a couple of tenths of a low spot in the middle where the bolts are, which makes sense. That's gonna distort the vise slightly when you bolt it down. That's okay though. That middle part of the vise isn't really doing anything anyway. And I also set up a one, two, three block with the exact same conditions that I'm cutting in just to make sure that there's nothing untoward there. And I don't see any error here either. There's another category of issues that we might be chasing here. One is not in the head and another is lean in the column. Neither of those will show up with the tests we've done so far. Importantly, neither of these issues can affect the squareness of your cut because the distance between the center line and the surface of the work as it moves is not changing. So like tram, nod and lean will affect the flatness of your surface, but not the squareness of the cuts. A way to check for nod issues indirectly is with that same water slide effect, because if you have some nod in the head, it will show up in the y-axis of your cut, the same as tram issues show up in the x-axis. So if our cutter is cattywampus like this, on the x-axis, it's gonna show up as a sawtooth cut, but if you make a cut in the y-axis, it's gonna show up as a water slide. So if you suspect nod is causing a step effect in your cuts that you normally do on the x-axis, try a y-axis cut and see if you get a water slide. My next move, however, was to do those same two cuts we did, all the same settings, but cutting right to left to see if the step between those passes changed. If it does, that again points to a tram issue because we're getting double cutting one way and not the other. And sure enough, we've got now a step of only four or five tenths. So it's starting to look like we may have a tram issue again somehow. So I checked it again, showing zero on this side, come around to the other side, and two and a half thou. So our tram adjustment from last time didn't hold. I had plenty of time to think about why this might be as I was redoing the tram and then reinstalling and reindicating the vise. And I realized that when I did the tram the first time, I forgot to lock the column. So the gibs were sitting loose and all of my tapping on the head was just causing the gibs to shift around and then they shifted back to wherever they wanted to sit with the head unlocked. So make sure you lock everything up before you do tramming. Now, how are we doing? We got a couple tenths short of three there and right on three there. So this thing's now trammed within a couple of tenths over 24 inches. Probably the best setup this machine has ever been. Do the cuts again and our 1,000 step is still there. So we definitely did have a tram problem that we fixed, but it does not seem to be the core issue with my out of squareness or the steps between my passes. So let's go back to a few first principles once again. I'm gonna indicate on the fixed jaw of the vise and see how vertical that is. 
I'm not able to detect any error there, but since I don't have a tense indicator, here's a trick to get more resolution. Set up something tall and precise in the vise and indicate on that instead. And here we can see that there's a few tenths detectable over about four inches here, but really, again, nothing that could cause anywhere close to the 15 thou of out of square that we were seeing. Fun fact about this technique of indicating on a straight edge, it will also tell you if you have lean in the column because if the distance between the straight edge and the indicator changes as it moves downwards, then that means that the dovetails that the head is sliding on are not at a right angle to where that vise is sitting on the table. However, it will not tell you if you have nod in the head, because in that case, as the head moves up and down, the relationship between that straight edge and the column isn't changing. Earlier I said that all of these geometry issues that could potentially exist don't affect the squareness of your cut. And in general, that's one of the strengths of a column architecture. However, there's one big exception to that, and that's if you're using a cutter that's of diameter larger than the piece that you're facing. In that case, any error in nod or lean will affect the squareness of the cut because you're only doing one pass. However, if you do the same facing operation with many passes of a small mill, again, like our tiny water slide experiment that we did earlier, then uh, any error in nod or lean is gonna get canceled out by those multiple passes. You're gonna end up with little saw teeth for ants, but you're not gonna end up with an out of square cut. If you're using a small diameter cutter, the only way to get an out of square face is if the table slide in this case in the y-axis direction is actually running up or downhill relative to that cutter. And this is where a knee mill is actually slightly more susceptible to this problem because the slides are hanging on the dovetails of the knee. So if that knee is sagging at all, that will definitely affect the squareness of your cut regardless of the diameter of your cutter. So putting all this together, if you suspect nod or lean problems in your column or your head, then try doing different passes with small and large diameter cutters in the X and Y axis. And then you can synthesize the combination of symptoms that you get if you get saw teeth or if you get water slides, etc., to determine whether you might have lean or nod or tram issues or none of the above or all of the above. A very reasonable next question is then if you find error in one of these interfaces, either nod in the head or lean in the column, what do you do about it? Well, the same thing as you do with any system where you find error, be it a part setup or an interface in a casting or anywhere else. If there's an adjustment, use it. If there's not an adjustment, then you got to shim it. Shim it good. So on the head of this particular mill, here's the column here, and then the dovetails and gibs are inside here. And then this seam right here is the joint between the head and the movable section of dovetails. And so this is the joint where the head rotates when you tram it, and so this would also be a good place to shim it. If your mill has a knot adjustment, great, use it. Uh, this mill does not, so if I had a knot issue, I would need to put shims in here. Or if I was trying to tackle a lean problem in the column, then I'd need to look down here to where the column attaches to the base, and so I might consider putting shims in here. Now, of course, shimming something is often a big project, you have to dismantle the thing that you're shimming to some degree, but there's another more important price that you will pay, and that's a loss of rigidity. As soon as you start shimming interfaces between castings, that interface gets less rigid. So think twice before doing that. Uh, the error has to be, I think, pretty large to, to warrant that kind of intervention. You know, if you've got a thou or something of column lean, uh, I just learned to live with it. You know, you can adjust for that in types of cutters that you use and how you set up work in the vise if that small amount of error is showing up in your parts. Uh, if you're looking at something like five or six thou, I have seen that on some of these budget mills. I have used a friend's budget mill that had five thou of nod in the head. And uh, that, you know, wasn't definitely showing up in the parts, and so you might then consider uh, getting dramatic with shims. But with these small hobbyist grade machines, rigidity is generally much more precious than any, any other commodity on the machine. So uh, small errors in the castings you can work around and, you know, learn to live with. If you decide you do want to go down the road of shimming something, you're going to need shim stock, something like this guy. This is a variety pack. It's the Neapolitan ice cream of shims, and uh, you can get a pack like this on Amazon, and I will link to it in the description below. It's great. It's got thicknesses of precision steel from uh, one thou all the way up to 15 thou in one or two thou increments. There's even some half thou increments in here, so uh, pretty much anything you need to adjust, you can adjust with a box of this stuff. It's not very expensive, 
There's enough here to probably last a lifetime. All right, back to basics. I'm gonna set the stock up in the vise, same way that I had it set up before. I'm gonna clamp it up, same way as I had it before, tap it down like a good little machinist, and let's see where we're at here. Now look at that, you can see how out of square that is. That's quite a bit off, there's that 15 thou. Well, what else is novel in this setup? Well, this extrusion is pretty thin walled and I noticed that when I clamp it, the front face moves seven thousandths. That might be a clue. Could I be distorting it with the vise? So I did the same test with the indicator on top of the vise and as I clamp it tight, look at that, I get 13 thousandths of movement on that top. And then checking the square on the back again and it's way out of square. So it's actually the clamping action that's causing this part to be misaligned in the vise. Well, now I'm suspecting my round bar there and my setup on the movable jaw. So I took it out, clamped it up again, same setup, haven't moved anything. And now I get a few tenths of jaw lift on the top of that part. And if I put the square on the back, my 15 thou of out of vertical is gone. So all along, it was seems to be just the way that I was squeezing it in the vise with that piece of round bar. So I did another test cut, this time just using a piece of paper on that movable jaw to take up any surface imperfections and minimize the influence of jaw lift a little bit. And now, perfectly square. No light coming through there at all. And our old friend, the step, also gone. I can't feel it. It might be detectable with a tense indicator. Really, it's hard to say for sure, but I certainly can't feel it. So it goes to show, even though this is the common wisdom for how to set up a part on surfaces that have not yet been machined, this is how everybody says to do it. This is how I've always done it. This is how I've often told you to do it. Don't be afraid to challenge assumptions if you're not getting the results that you expect. Something about this piece of round bar in there was causing the part to roll upwards out of square in the vise. It's not usually what happens, but that is what was happening here. Remember our old friend, the molehill? Well, this also went away after this change in setup, getting rid of that round bar. So maybe the round bar was putting weird forces on this part because it's an extrusion. It might've been distorting something slightly, or again, extrusions have weird internal forces on them because of how they're made. So maybe the part relaxed a little bit after being machined. Hard to say, but this problem also went away. So check your assumptions. Don't be afraid to experiment. I hope you found something in here useful. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.